Hey everybody and welcome to my video introducing the Wazong SFJ3. I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce that too much. Have patience with me, I am after all. Just a silly American. The Wazong SFJ3. This is a fixed lens, twin lens reflex camera. Twin lens meaning it has a viewing lens and a taking lens and that the light only goes from the light going through the viewing lens only goes to your eye and the light going to the taking lens only goes to the film reflex meaning that there's a reflex mirror inside of it that directs the light from the viewing lens up to your eye it has no light meter the shutter speeds are bulb and one second to one five hundredth of a second it has 100 percent viewfinder magnification 100% viewfinder frame coverage and a clear field focusing screen with with grid lines for six by four and a half images if you are lucky enough as I am not to have the six by four and a half screen that goes in the back of it so that this camera can take either six by six or six by four and a half images and the flash on this sinks at any speed so some things about this camera this camera is one of many, many, many nearly identical cameras made in China. And, but, but this one in particular, its target market were mid-range users and entry-level TLR users. It has simply stunning optics. Uh, I've seen some sample photos online. I've taken two rolls of film with it and I've looked at them. I haven't scanned them yet, but looking at them, I'm really impressed by how sharp the optics on this camera are, and it's the only camera I've ever seen that has teal colored glass. So I'm not sure if that's a coating, or the, I've got to imagine it's the coating, so I'm not sure what kind of coating it is. But I've never seen one before like that, where it's this iridescent teal aquamarine color from every angle. And it is kind of blue, uh, it is kind of beautiful and reflective. These have very few features, no double exposure prevention, but they have very good shutter speeds and they're reliable because they use imported Copal shutters. So this was made at the Huazong Precision Instrument Factory in Hubei province in China. When it was made, it's absolutely unknown. I mean, I was not able to find any resource, including the authoritative Cameras of China book by Douglas St. Denny that indicated when this may have been made. The best I was able to find was that the factory opened sometime in the early 1950s and maybe produced cameras into the 1980s. So, but this camera itself is probably a slightly older one because it has slightly older interfaces. And if you look at a comparable ca camera, the King Dao, it has a more modern interface. This camera was preceded by an earlier and poorly documented version of the Wazong TLR. So when I was researching this, everything online indicated, oh, there's this one version of the Wazong, one version, and, and there also was not a whole lot of information known about it. However, looking at the photo in the Chinese camera book of the Wazong SF3, and then looking at my camera, which is marked the SFJ3, there are some notable differences. For instance, in this older version, the shutter speed only goes up to 1 300th of a second, and the shutter speeds are located on the left side of the shutter. On mine, this is the aperture adjustment. And this older version also has a silver plate that is metal or appears to be metal instead of the plastic plate here. On mine, my shutter goes up to 1 500th of a second. But the biggest difference is just that mine is marked SFJ and that one is marked SF3, which would indicate that there is in fact some difference in model that was made, or there, there was some sequence of models or different models themselves. Something happened during the production that changed the designation from SF to SFJ. 
other than that they're they're very similar this one has the flash pc port up at my camera for instance one other difference it has the flash pc port up here at the top right the sf has it down here on this in this area so the whole point of that is that there were some differences in camera production over its lifespan and arguably probably even two different models the sf and sfj uh, both hyphen three this was produced concurrently with other similar models and this this itself is an imitation of the seagull tlr which is itself an imitation of a japanese tlr i forget the name of the japanese T tlr is itself an imitation of a raleigh cord and um so it's an imitation of an imitation of an imitation and, and for all the times it's an imitation it turns out itself to be a very good camera but it was produced concurrently with other similar models made at other factories around china seagull shanghai king dao hong mei five goats my favorite name for a camera ever by the way the tianjin e-star the wuhan yuyi and Pearl River, among many, many others. In fact, the book that you just saw a page out of contains many makes of TLR that I couldn't find anything about online. So, and as for what this was followed by, probably nothing, honestly. This was, there may have been another model. I don't know, the information on this camera is very, very scant. But it was uh, probably not followed by anything. This is probably the last model of TLR that that factory made. Uh, and I don't even know if the factory is still open or not. So if you have your SFJ3, let's grab that and we'll take a look at the features. Or even if you don't, if you're just interested in this obscure little uh, Chinese camera. On the top we have, the first we have the strap lugs here. Which is what you would attach your camera strap, uh, your camera to the strap with. We have the serial number up here on the top. That is a very long serial number, and my guess is that they didn't, did, they did not actually make uh, four million of them. My guess is that they started with a high serial number to make it seem like lots of them had been made. <clears throat> Here we have the viewfinder cover, and it flips up, and it's a pretty smooth operation to flip it up. In fact. Here's the sport finder that you can look through to do quick focusing and just line up things and take photos. There is also this switch here, which in a properly functioning camera causes the magnifying glass to simply pop up, but in mine allows me to now go in and root around with my fingers for the magnifying glass and force it to pop up against its will. There we go. And the magnifying glass allows you to do fine focusing on the on the viewing screen. This is the viewing screen here, and you can see the grid lines on it. And those grid lines are for the middle grid line, which is uh, illuminated right now, is for horizon correction. And there's a vertical grid line, which is for vertical correction. There's a lower grid line, and uh, can we even? There's also an upper grid line, which I can't seem to get illuminated. The upper and bottom grid lines indicate the six by four and a half framing size, so that if you use the six by four and a half mask to take 16 images, you don't overlap images, and um, or cut off things you don't want to cut off. They are not rule of thirds composition lines, unfortunately. On the camera's front, <clears throat> we have these marks right here. So my brother's father-in-law and mother-in-law were both born in China and speak Chinese uh, as would be expected very well. So I sent them pictures of this camera and said, what does all this stuff mean? And he said, the script on the top means Wazong, H-U-A space Z-H-O-N-G. And what that means is central China. It doesn't mean middle of the world, middle country, anything like that. It simply means this was made in central China. And the, uh, so that's, I think that's Wazong, uh, read left to right. And, and uh, specifically in this case, the production location was Hubei. So lo construction, lo uh, construction mark or name brand taking lens, or sorry, this is the viewing lens here, and it is the same as the taking lens. These are interchangeable elements. 
Here's your flash PC port. This is your shutter cocking lever. This is your aperture selector. This is your shutter speed selector. This is the, your self timer. And this is your shutter release button right here. On this side of the camera, we have knobs that will um, hold the film spool in place and, and also retract so that you can remove the film spool. Here we have the focusing knob and the accessory shoe. On the side above the knob, the focusing knob, we have the hyperfocal distance scale. And the way this works is that these numbers are in meters. So if you were at f22, right now everything from infinity down to just shy of three meters would be in focus. And likewise, without changing this, if you were at f11, everything from 10 meters to just shy of four meters would be in focus. So that's how you read this. If you're going to focus on something close, as close as you can focus in fact, so let's say right here, everything, if you're at f22, everything from about just shy of 1.2 meters to just shy of a meter would be in focus. So that's how, that's how the focusing uh, hyperfocus scale works. On the other side we have the film advance knob and that's it. On the bottom we have the tripod bushing in the center here. Four legs that you can set the camera on. This is the film back lock. This is a really nice feature actually. You can't open the film back accidentally. You have to unlock it. And we have O for open, C for close, which are also uh, Hoi and Quan in Chinese. That's what those, those uh, characters mean. And that's how you open the back. You just rotate that. Take a look inside the back in just a moment. On the actual back of the camera, we have the slide which reveals the red windows for counting your, your film. So as you advance the film, you count the numbers coming up through the red windows. The 12 indicates 6x6 six six, and the 16 indicates 6x4.5. Six so if you were using 6x4.5, you would count the numbers coming through this window. If you're going full square, you would count it with the, uh, the numbers coming through the 12 window. We will open the camera back. Inside we have the film spool, the new, the new film spool area right here. We have a film guide roller here and here. Those help the film to proceed smoothly through the camera. These are the film guide rails which work with the film pressure plate to keep the film flat on plane. These four outer things keep the film uh, paper from moving to side to side as it as it progresses, but my guess is that's also how the six by four and a half screen fits into the camera. This is where the old spool goes for the take up spool. On the camera's back we have the film pressure plate right here and you can see the holes cut out for the red windows for counting the frames as they go past. So the next thing we're going to do is load film and I'm going to show you the process by which film is loaded and how this operates. And then I'm going to show you how to take a picture with this camera. So to load the film, we just push the unlock on the film back release, rotate the lock and up. And now we have the film back open. So I'm going to grab a, a spool of 120 paper, no actual film on this. and. It's a little bit tricky sometimes to get this film loaded and sometimes it just pops right in. So pull out a nice leader for yourself. Line it up with the slot and the take-up spool. And the take-up spool is the old film spool that you had. And there we go. Just advance. And then once the double arrow reaches that bottom point, that's when you would close the film back and lock it and you want to now lift up the red windows. As you advance the film you'll see there the here comes the black arrow coming through the red windows and that lets you know that the film is being taken up properly. Next thing we're going to see are some other arrows. There's the first of them and here comes the second of them and now we will see some circles coming up here 
So if you were taking six by four and a half, you would stop there. The number one is in your six by four and a half frame. If you're taking six by six, you would stop there as the number one is now in your six by six frame. And what you would do is you would take a picture, advance the film and move on. But I'm going to show you before we take a picture, what's happening inside your camera as you take a picture. So let's say that you've sighted your, your subject, you've focused on it, you've set the shutter and the aperture and you've taken your picture, click. Now what you want to do is advance the film. And when you advance the film, it just rolls. And there are some things to be to note. This now is on frame two. If you advance it too far, there is no going back. Also, there's no double exposure prevention, so you could take a picture and then take another picture and then another picture. And if you forget to advance the frame, then uh, you will have multiple exposures on the same uh, on the same frame. Now, that can be really good if you intend to take double exposures, and it can be really awful if you just forget to advance film, which I've done both of with this camera already. Yeah. So you take all of your pictures and you go through, and this has 12 6x6 pictures that it will take, or 16 6x4.5. Last frame. And then you'll see a black bar come through the windows, like that. And then another one, and then it says exposed. And at this point it's okay and safe to open up the film back. And remember, of course, when you have real film in here, you can't just have the film back open. You'll ruin your film and you won't get any images. So anytime you have film in the camera, you need to have the film back shut. So once you've taken up the film onto the spool, to re remove the spool, you lift up that left peg and then slide it out easily like that. With real film, you tuck the, the flap over and then run the sticky stuff around it so that it stays shut until you take it off to be developed. Then before you load your next roll, you pull out the spool from the bottom. And the way that I load this is I line this up so that the slot on the inside there is vertical. And I line that up so that it's vertical. I pull out the knob on the left and then I will spin this while trying to seat the spool. There we go, that oh, almost had it. One of the design flaws about this camera is that the spools do not seat very easily. There's just a little bit too little space. There we go, that just went in right there. As soon as I say it doesn't spool, spool easily, the camera says no, I'm just gonna prove you wrong. So, um, so you take the old spool and you put it in the top and you're ready to go with your next spool to just load it up. So let's talk about the actual process of taking a picture and how you would go about it. Now this has no light meter, so you can either carry along a light meter, which could clip into the accessory shoe right there if you wanted. So you could clip a light meter into the accessory shoe if you wanted, or if you don't want to do that, you can just use the Sunny 16 rule, which is where the uh, if, if a subject is in full sun, at f16, the shutter speed is your film speed. So 100 ISO film, f16, subject in full sun, 1 100th of a second for your shutter speed. And then there's some compensation you can do for shade, indoors, nighttime, and so forth. But once you've got your shutter speed and your aperture determined, you set your aperture here to whatever you want it to be. You set your shutter speed here to whatever you want it to be. And then you cock the shutter. And once you've finished your focus, you take your picture, and then you advance your film manually. Now, when you're actually focusing, you would look through the top here, and then you would use the magnifying glass to get your fine focus and get your, your exact point of focus spot on. One thing this camera allows you to do is take very easy double exposures. So the process for taking the double exposure mechanically is pretty simple. You set your aperture, your shutter speed, you focus, you arm your shutter, you take a picture, arm your shutter, you take a picture. And those don't have to be next to each other at the same time. They can be separated by minutes or seconds or hours. 
different subjects, same subject, whatever you want your double exposure to look like. That's the mechanics of it. Remember, whenever you take a double exposure, that you have to compensate for the double exposure. So if your meter tells you that you need to set your camera at 1 1 25th of a second at f5.6, then for a double exposure, you actually need to set it at 1 250th and take two exposures. Because two 1 250th of a second exposures equals 1 125th. If you were to take two exposures at the stated meter reading, it would be very washed out and overexposed. Likewise, if you wanted to do three at the same meter reading, you'd have to set it at 1 500th and then take your three images. If you do flash photography, this camera has the flash PC port. It has no hot shoe, but it will sync an X flash at uh, any of the shutter speeds. It may also be able to sync an FP flash. I don't know. I couldn't find anything saying whether it could or not. Um, but who cares because FP flash bulbs aren't made anymore. So some special features and notes about this. Like I said, I've never ever before seen a camera other than this one that has a teal lens coating on it. And I really don't know what it is. It's from some ang it's it's iridescent from from every angle. And sometimes it looks purple, other times it looks teal and aquamarine and blue and, and green. And it's just this rainbow of pleasing and cool colors. And it is very nice looking and simply stunning. And I haven't taken any color film with this yet, but I've seen photos taken with color film with this camera and the lens coating does not affect colors. In fact, uh, the color transmission on this camera is, is phenomenal. This is a very basic TLR and it can be picked up and learned by anyone in about five minutes, at least the basic operation of it. It's easy to use and it relies on tried mechanical technologies from the 1940s. So uh, there's not a whole lot of cutting edge learning curve type stuff in this camera. Everything that's in it is a known quantity and so they're fairly reliable. Mine has a 1 500th of a second leaf shutter which is very fast. Apparently most Chinese TLRs only go up to 1 300th of a second. Um, but this, the later ones here, the SFJs, uh, uh, incorp included imported Comper shutters. And uh, oh, I also mentioned that my, my brother's father-in-law translated this for me. He added when he, he emailed me back that he used to use cameras like this when he was a kid in China. Uh, they were very expensive. They didn't get to use them very often because they were very expensive to get the film developed. But he spoke very highly of the quality of optics and of camera uh, construction in general being produced in, in um, China at the time that these cameras were being made. So a couple things not to do with your camera. Uh, don't touch the shutter. You can take the lens elements off. In fact, uh, I didn't on this one, but I did on one of my other TLRs in order to get the shutter working again. But um, it's not too difficult to take them apart, but if you do, don't, don't stick your finger in the shutter and don't, don't push on the shutter leaf. So it's a good way to completely ruin a shutter. Don't touch the mirror. Uh, again, if you are touching the mirror, it means you've taken the top of this off, which also is not incredibly difficult to do uh, if you need to get in there to clean the mirror with an air blower or something. The mirrors are surface coated, so if you touch them, then uh, you stand a very good chance of damaging the, uh, the, the mirror coating material. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because they can be damaged by both heat and cold. The heat can cause the oils to get very thin and get to places they shouldn't be and the cold can cause them to break down and, uh, and become gummy. Don't store your, your camera in a plastic bag or box because that's a really good way to get fungus in them and the fungus will eat the coatings on these lenses and will possibly also eat the, le the leather. And don't let your camera get wet because that will cause the components to rust or in other ways stop working. And also will help get mildew to grow in the camera's leather. So just remember your camera is a precision tool it should, and it should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. Uh, now, in just a second, we're going to go and take a look at actual photos taken with this camera. But if you have any, if this video was helpful to you, please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track. 
you have any questions about this or other Chinese cameras or cameras in general, let me know. I'm more than happy to, t to answer the questions if I can. And uh, if you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, let me know. And if I have the equipment and technical know-how, I'm happy to make them for you. If you'd like to subscribe, uh, I actually have some more Chinese TLR videos in the works as soon as the, the cameras arrive. And uh, I have other photography videos coming as well. And one last thing before we go to photos, thank you guys for watching. China in the 1960s believed that optics were its future. And sure, they've been part of it with cameras like the Seagull and this Wazong. And the Wazong is only one of myriad of Chinese cameras that include common types like the Shanghai and extreme rarities like the Five Goats. But the Wazong stands out as very possibly the best among them. The factory that built the Wazong was the only one, insofar as I could find in my research, that imported foreign shutters instead of making their own. So these shutters in these Wazongs are faster with more stable and accurate shutter speeds than other Chinese cameras. The, the Wazong goes up to 1 500th, whereas, for instance, my East Star and my Pearl River each only go up to 1 300th. And the mechanics on these were simple and reliable, so they keep working well. And the lens optics are simply spectacular with exceedingly sharp images, nice contrast, and fantastic image rendering. The, these Chinese cameras, they're all copies of the Hong Kong Seagull or Shanghai, depending on what source you read. Regardless, these Hong Kong cameras, which the Chinese cameras were copies of, were themselves copies of post-World War II Japanese TLRs that were themselves copies of the German Raleigh Chords. So the Wazong is a copy of a copy of a copy of an original, and for that it suffers none. If you're looking for an obscure camera to get attention with, and this camera attracts as much attention as my Pentax 6x7 or and Nikon F, mostly due to the Chinese characters on the front. Well, this is a good attention getter, but it's more than that because the Wazong is so mechanically simple. The camera's operation does not get involved with your creative process. All you need to do is keep your finger away from the bottom lens and focus correctly. If your settings are accurate, you'll do just fine and be very impressed with the results. So what do I mean by that, by how good it is? My TLRs include a Ricomatic 225, and this is equally good to that. And there's my Raleigh Flex Old Standard, and the Huazong is almost as good. If there is one Chinese-made TLR worth buying to use, it is the Huazong.